Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeets, and today we're going to be going over and self-scoring our first practice FRQ in this FRQ Friday series. Now, if you haven't watched that first video in the FRQ Friday series explaining how it's going to work, make sure to check that video out first, then write the practice FRQ, then come back to this video with your practice FRQ so that you can follow along and self-score it. Now, on our very first FRQ Friday practice series, we had practice FRQs submitted by Aiden, Ava, Black Swan, Camila, Chloe, and three ape scholars who wish to remain anonymous. And we're also gonna be giving a shout out to Mr. Salas, I hope I pronounced your name right, who teaches at Los Baños High School in California. He had a couple different ape scholars submit practice FRQs this week. Now, unfortunately, we're only gonna have time to score two of the FRQs that were submitted this week, but keep writing them, keep sending them in, and it could be you that's featured in next week's video. Now, before we get into scoring these two practice FRQs today, I wanna to warn you that through eight years of having my own student self-score FRQs, they almost always tend to overscore FRQs, especially early in the year. So be sure that you're following along really closely, looking at the scoring rubric and asking yourself two fundamental questions for each parts of your FRQ as you score it. That first question you need to ask yourself is which of these potential bullet point answers from the rubric am I attempting to earn here? And the second point you should be asking yourself is have I met all of the answer requirements in order to earn the point for that answer option? Let's take a closer look at the scoring rubric for today's practice FRQ so that I can explain what I mean by the bullet pointed answer options, as well as all of the required parts for each answer option. So right off the bat, notice that each part of the FRQ will clearly state how many possible points there are for that question. Then beneath that, you'll usually see a bullet pointed list or a table that's going to provide all of the possible answers that can be accepted for credit on this part of the FRQ. So remember, as you follow along and score at home, you have to constantly ask yourself, which bullet point or possible point on the rubric might I be earning here? And how closely does my answer align with one of these possible answers from the rubric? So with that being said, it's time to get out that red pen or the red highlighter tool if you're on Google Docs, your meanest FRQ scoring face, and let's get started. The scoring rubric for today's FRQ is down in the video description below, but you can always just follow along on screen here if that's easier for you. Now, our very first FRQ Friday submission of the year comes to us from an ape scholar named Aiden. So thank you, Aiden, for sending in your practice FRQ to be scored here on the channel. You are an ape scholar of the highest order. Let's get into Aiden's practice FRQ and see how he did. So now that we've gone over the basic format of FRQ rubrics, let's take a look at this specific FRQ rubric along with Aiden's practice answers. And remember, as we look at each part of Aiden's response, we're gonna need to look over at the scoring rubric and familiarize ourselves with the requirements for a correct answer. Now, since the only real answer option on the rubric for question A part one is photosynthesis here, let's walk through this question together. So when we look at the rubric, we wanna try and find all the required parts of a correct answer. Notice that photosynthesis is clearly stated here in the rubric, so students must name that process in their answer. Then they would need to specify that this process is done by plants or autotrophs, and next they would need to specify that carbon dioxide, not just carbon, is taken in by the plant. And finally, they need to specify that this carbon dioxide is converted or used in order to make food or glucose or sugar or complex carbohydrates. Let's take a look at Aiden's response now and see how he did. Since he clearly stated that photosynthesis is the process, that it's taking place in plants, and that carbon dioxide is absorbed and glucose is the organic molecule produced, he earns the point. Now in part two, we're gonna read his answer first and figure out which of these possible answer options from the bullet pointed list on the rubric he might be able to earn. Since he clearly states that the process is respiration, we're going to look at that part of the rubric as we score his response. And notice here that the three key parts of this answer on the rubric are respiration, the breakdown of glucose, and the release of carbon dioxide. Now he's so close to earning the point here because he identifies respiration as the process and because he describes the breakdown of glucose. But since he states that carbon is released rather than carbon dioxide, he unfortunately misses this point. Now this might seem really harsh, but remember there are other gases that contain carbon, such as methane, so it's really important to specify the exact molecule that is returning carbon to the atmosphere. Now in question B part one, Aiden unfortunately again narrowly misses this first point on the rubric because he didn't specify that the phytoplankton and algae are taking in carbon dioxide. And once again, this is why precision and writing like a scholar are so important on the FRQ section of the exam. The prompt here is asking about atmospheric carbon that's being incorporated into oceanic sinks. So when he says that phytoplankton take in carbon, does that mean methane from the atmosphere? or carbon dioxide, 
or carbonate ions from the ocean water. Unfortunately, the readers that score your AP exam in May can only score exactly what you have written not what they think you're implying. And so you have to be completely precise. Now, luckily he salvaged the second point in B part one by describing this idea of a biological pump. And that's the idea that dead organic matter sinks to the ocean or reaches the benthic zone and is deposited or buried here, which is incorporating it into an oceanic sink. He also picks up another point in B part two by identifying sedimentary rock. And this brings us to an important piece of FRQ strategy. Notice here how much easier identify points are to earn than explain points. This is why I always try to stress to my students that you have to make sure you try all of the identify questions on each prompt so that you don't invest a ton of energy into four explain prompts in FRQs one and two, and then not even make it to a couple of easy identify points in the third FRQ. Now in part C, Aiden earns another point by describing cows releasing methane as a human action that contributes to increasing carbon concentrations in the atmosphere. Now in his second answer for part C, he was very close to the deforestation point on the rubric, but he didn't specify that trees release previously stored carbon through the process of decomposition or decay. In part D, he picks up the easy identification point by stating that ocean acidification is an environmental problem that results from elevated atmospheric carbon concentrations. But he unfortunately mixes up the direction of the pH scale and states that the pH of water will become too high for marine organisms instead of saying too low. And finally, Aiden closes out this practice of our cue by picking up two more points in part E, the first for describing that phosphorus lacks a gas phase and the second for identifying that it is necessary for the composition of DNA. So overall, Aiden ended up with a seven out of 10 on this FRQ, which is an awesome score. If you wanna see how your own practice FRQ score would translate to a potential exam score in May, make sure to go down in the video description below and grab your own copy of the APES exam score calculator. Now let's take a look at how to use that calculator to predict an overall exam score using Aiden's practice FRQ here. So if we assume that Aiden scores similarly on his other two FRQs and averages a seven out of 10 on the FRQ section of the exam, and then combines that FRQ performance with a multiple choice score in the 80s to 90s, which is typically where I see my students who score in the seven out of 10 FRQ range, we can see that he's got a great chance of earning a five on that exam in May. And remember that if you wanna plug your practice FRQ and multiple choice test scores from class into the exam score calculator, hop down into the video description and grab your own copy. Just remember that writing one practice of our queue in your bedroom in 35 minutes in the middle of November is way different than writing three FRQs in 70 minutes under the stressful conditions of that AP exam in May. And remember that students almost always overestimate their FRQ scores, especially at this point in the year. So for both of these reasons, I recommend actually lowering your FRQ average by one full point in order to compensate for both the ease of writing practice FRQs and the likelihood of overscoring. That way, when you're typing in potential FRQ scores to this calculator, you account for both of those factors, as well as giving yourself a little bit of wiggle room when it comes to the actual exam in May. Now that we've scored our two practice FRQs and taken a look at how to use the exam score calculator, let's take a look at next week's FRQ Friday prompt, which comes to us from the 2013 exam and focuses on biodiversity. So in part eight, we start off with a nice describe prompt. So of course, we wanna circle that describe and write a two above it to remind us that this requires two layers of detail. The next step is to find our target or what comes directly after our task verb. And in this case, we need two characteristics and the modifier or the thing that those characteristics have to apply to are ecosystems that have high biodiversity. So we need to make sure that for each of these two characteristics, they are shared by ecosystems that have high biodiversity and they each have two layers of detail. Now in letter B, we have a little bit of an outdated prompt structure since this is from 2013. But the basic idea here is we have an identify and an explain, and we're actually gonna treat these almost like two separate prompts. So for the identify, I'm gonna circle and write a one next to it to remind myself one simple layer of detail. And our target here is two specific human activities, but they have to be human activities that result in a loss of biodiversity. Now for the second part, I'm gonna circle explain and write a three above it to remember we need three layers of detail and we need to explain how each activity, so our explanation has to be how the activity actually lowers biodiversity. Now in part C, we have another slightly outdated task verb. We have propose a practical strategy, which is the same as proposing a solution under the new 2019 CED. But the basic idea here is that we need the human activities identified from above 
and we need to propose a practical strategy other than banning them to reduce the loss of biodiversity. So I'm gonna circle propose and write a two above it because you should try to aim for two layers of detail. You wanna go a little bit deeper than just stating the practical strategy. You wanna give some justification or some specificity for how it's actually gonna work. Now, what are we proposing? We are proposing a practical strategy for each human activity. So we actually need two practical strategies. We need to make sure we don't lose sight of that. Again, we have numerous modifiers here, which makes this prompt a little bit tricky. So I'm gonna put a box on one of the modifiers. We can't just ban the activity. So we can't say that deforestation can no longer be done ever. That's not gonna work. Uh, and so the final modifier here to consider is that these practical strategies have to reduce the loss of biodiversity. So they have to be practical, they have to reduce loss of biodiversity, and you can't simply ban the activities that you identified above. Now in prompt B, we're back to a simple, straightforward describe question. So we're gonna circle describe, write a two above it. And what do we need to describe? We need one naturally occurring factor. And this factor needs to lead to a loss of biodiversity. So our target has to be a naturally occurring factor. The modifier is that it must lead to a loss of biodiversity. And finally, we wrap up this FRQ in part E with another describe prompt. We'll write a two above it. And in this case, we need two ecological benefits and they must be ecological benefits provided by greater biodiversity. So that is our modifier there. And there you have it, Ape Scholars. Another FRQ Friday practice FRQ is annotated and ready for you to practice writing. And remember that when you go to write this, you wanna set yourself a 20 minute timer so you can simulate the time setting of that actual Apes exam in May. And if you want your practice FRQ scored in next week's FRQ Friday video, make sure to snail mail or email it to me by the Wednesday after this video is posted. Thank you once again to Aiden, Ava, Camila, Chloe, Black Swan, and our three anonymous Ape Scholars who sent in their practice FRQs. I appreciate your willingness to share your practice FRQs with the Apes community here so that we can all learn from them. And as always, think like a mountain and write like a scholar.